based on lectures in history. University of Arkansas professor Elliot West lectures about the environmental impact of the California gold rush. He describes how 19th century mining practices led to deforestation, mercury contamination, and sediment-clogged rivers. This class was part of a seminar for high school teachers hosted by the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. You see, how better that makes you feel. Right. Oops, I got a signal here. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I hope everyone had a good day yesterday. I certainly did. It was a lot of fun. Well, uh, we can talk about it later, obviously. Um, today, we're going to look at the environmental impact uh, of the California gold rush. I'd like to begin by, as I said at the, at the beginning of the first, uh, the first presentation, I'd like to begin by thinking, uh, trying to think a little larger than we normally do here. Let's pull back into the context of this. Uh, what's going on? What's going on out there? My uh, advisor, Bob Athern, uh, at the um, University of Colorado, we were talking once, and he said, you know, historians only ask one question. I said, yeah? He said, what's going on here? So I sort of nodded and thought, hmm, you know, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard a smart man say. <laughs> but he's absolutely right. He's abs- that's, all, that's really the only question we ask. We, we go back to this earlier time, you know, the, the past is a foreign country, as they say. We go back to this, this time in the past, and we look around and we say, what's going on? What's happening here? What's going on with the California girl? Lots of stuff. I hope you're getting that idea so far. Uh, but one of the things that's happening is that the, the place itself, the environment itself, is being fundamentally transformed, remade. Now, this, of course, is, a, is an episode uh, in American westward expansion, expansion that starts here on the Atlantic coast, and moves, gr- moves across the country, a very dramatic development from 1845 to 1848 with the acquisition of Texas and the Oregon Territory and the Mexican Cession. So by 1848, uh, with the Gadsden Purchase down here in 1853, then uh, we have the contiguous 48 states. So America has expanded across the country. But, uh, so this was part of that. But what I want to begin with is by emphasizing that the, the, gold, the California gold rush and the, all of the gold and silver rushes that followed that were fundamentally different as a form of westward expansion. Uh, two reasons, two ways. First of all, they transformed the environment in radically new ways, different ways from earlier expansion. And we'll talk about that. The bulk of the, of the presentation will deal with that. Uh, to go back to our, our uh, hypothetical frontier family moving from North Carolina to into Tennessee. Uh, they were changing the environment, cutting down trees, plowing the fields. They were bringing in domestic animals that changed the sort of the faunal regime of that area. They were changing it. So were these guys, except they were changing it. They were changing it in, in very different ways, radically different ways. And we'll spend most of the presentation looking at that. But also, <clears throat> to step back even farther and look at this contextually, this was also a kind of westward expansion that was fundamentally different from those before. Those before to use a vastly oversimplified way of thinking of it, um, were like moving lines, a line moving from the Atlantic coast to the Appalachians, over the Appalachians, into the Trans-Appalachian area, to the Mississippi, and then gradually moving westward, primarily agrarian expansion, <clears throat> but essentially sort of a, a moving line like that. Like that. <laughs> a gold rush, or a silver rush, occurred typically in a place that's far removed from the expanding society of the East. This was sort of a gradual movement. The the society is sort of pushing itself outward in that way. These are different. They occur in places that are isolated. They occur in places that are far distant from the society over here. So it's more like they occur out here and then expand not as a line, but as an expanding circle, right? An expanding circle. So California, the California westward expansion doesn't look like that. It looks like that. <laughs> and then 18, 10 years later in Colorado, like that. 
and then up in the northern Rockies like that, and down the southwest like that. That's the kind of expansion we're looking at. It's not just what happens on the ground. It's the pattern of it, the pattern of it. You know, to me, I look at this and I think of, uh, I think of a, <laughs> an artillery shell <laughs> sort of lobbed into the back country. Right? So you go from here. <laughs> in Colorado. Up in Idaho and Montana. Like that. Right? <laughs> and they expand outward. Like that. This, is a, this, this is not an advancing frontier. This is a kind of a, a, what, a concussive frontier. Boom, like that. Right. You can even look at this um, geometrically or mathematically and get a sense of how this was, how this was different. Think of it this way. Um, you take a, a section of land that is one mile by one mile, right? This is the old, this is the line moving westward. And you move it, one side of it, a half a mile. You've increased the acreage from 640 acres to 960 acres, right? Okay, now you have a circle, boom, <laughs> and, it, and it contains 640 acres. The area of the circle is 640 acres. Now, you take this and you expand the radius half a mile. How many acres will that circle be? <laughs> that circle will be 2,276 acres. So, as a geometry of expansion and conquest, the expanding circle has it all over the advancing line. So that's what was happening out here. That's what was happening out here. Now, the, the catastrophic effect of this was on native peoples. And that's what the next two presentations are, are, are about. Uh, Al Hurtado is here this morning, uh, will speak, and then Willie Bauer uh, will speak on this. So I'm not going to pay a whole lot of attention to that, but keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Right? Especially going back to the first presentation when I talked about who was out here at the time of the gold rush. And I emphasize that the, the enormous variety of native peoples, virtually all of them live by an economy of hunting, gathering, and fishing. And I said that while that had great advantages in some ways. It, it gave them a pretty, pretty high standard of living. It required that they have virtually uninterrupted access to a large area. Any change in that would be a real problem. And this was a huge change that undercuts their environment, undercuts their economic system. Okay, so contextually, think of this as a, that, this sort of a big story. What's going on here? What's going on here is a, very, is a fundamentally different kind of westward expansion with different kinds of consequences. The second reason, remember, that this is, this is different is because of what happens in a gold rush or a silver rush as opposed to what happens with an advancing uh, farming frontier. So let's start with that. What, what does a mining camp need? to start, to get going, get going. Well, first of all, they need, people need places to live, cabins, stores. So you need wood, wood. And it's especially true, of course, when, uh, unlike a farming frontier where the population expands gradually and cuts down trees, this is the place where people come in by the hundreds and then the thousands. And they all need, they all need a lot of wood. Right? The first impact here was a, a stripping of the hillsides. And as we'll see in a moment, they also needed a lot of wood for the work that they did, you know, for the flumes and the sluices and the rest. So, uh, almost immediate deforestation around the camp itself. And that leads, of course, to erosion, problems with the streams, and the rest. A place to live. <laughs> they also need to eat. <laughs> to eat. <laughs> So another effect, right away, was the rapid depletion of game in the area. They had, um, these guys would go out uh, uh, to hunt just to feed themselves, but also to market it. Very quickly, these sort of meat stores appear. 
and they're hunting wild game, everything from squirrels to, uh, uh, to deer and elk and the rest of it. It depletes very, very quickly. This is an area that was uh, suited to the other thing I mentioned about the nature of native society here is that they lived in relatively small groups in rancherias, uh, very rarely more than about 125 people. So that's what this area was currently. That's the kind of numbers that this area was currently supporting. Now all of a sudden, you've got to support hundreds and hundreds of people and then thousands of people. And the game is poof. You know, it's, it's gone almost immediately. They begin importing food. Importing food. <laughs> Including <laughs> sea turtles from the Galapagos Islands were brought in. Uh, the, the, the sea turtle population of the Galapagos, you know, Darwin's turf, um, crashes, collapse as, as it comes back. Uh, but, uh, uh, but more than that, what you see is farmers come in, they begin to clear the land to feed the, far- to feed the miners. Ranchers come in, they begin to clear the land and to pasture their cattle there and to fence it off. All of this, of course, disrupts the environment in fundamental ways. So those are basic ways. The basic, first basic things that happen is simply by living there, simply by being there, these mining camps begin uh, to fundamentally change the environment that they're living in. What else? What is it about mining itself that has an effect? Well, this is the image that we have, most of us, I think, have going, growing up about what gold mining um, meant. This is, this is how it operated. And I've talked about this before. This pan mining, this is the way that they tested for gold to see if there's gold in a particular in a particular stream. Uh, went through that. This is placer gold, remember. This is the er- gold eroded from the, from the Sierra Nevada. The load mining I'll talk about a little bit later. So the placer mining begins this way. And once they can locate a place where there seems to be gold there, then they begin to move into slightly more elaborate operations. The first were things like this. It's called a rocker. I think there was a rocker at the museum yesterday. You see that? Yeah, the thing you go back and forth. Well, what a rocker is doing is essentially uh, that on a slightly larger scale. You can put more gravel, more dirt in it, move it back and forth. Instead of swishing the pan around, you know, you, you do this, and it washes through, and you catch it on, on these little cleats down here. I'll show you those in just a minute. So this is still a very, very simple operation. It's something that one man or two men or three men can do. But, of course, it doesn't pay very well. <laughs> Can't get much gold that way. So very, very soon they moved into a slightly larger system <clears throat> using uh, these things. This is called a long tom, a long tom. It was a, just a wooden trench. They diverted water and sent the water through it. And they would shovel dirt from around the creek into it. <laughs> now, this is... Can you imagine? It's hard enough. A couple, of, a few of you tried gold panning yesterday, right? It's not, not exactly a comfortable thing to do. Right? This is brutal work. You shovel dirt all day long, hour after hour after hour. Um, but what you do is just shovel the dirt in there. The wa- water washes through. This is a, this is a long time. You can see these. These are called cleats or riffles. So the water washes down here. The gold being heavy sinks down with the uh, other, uh, some other material as the, as the larger stuff washes through with the flow of water. And the gold is caught here. And then you go in with a pan and, take the, and scoop that out and extract the, the plaster gold, uh, the gold dust uh, out of that. So a bit more elaborate. This would take a company uh, of several men to do this, sometimes, sometimes larger. <laughs> and they would build, start to build these flumes sluices and flumes to bring water from other places. You need a lot of water to do this. Water to go into those long toms. And so you begin to build these to bring the water from elsewhere. What you're starting to do here is re-engineer the environment itself. Right? You're re-engineering the present flow of water into something else. And as we'll see, that escalates uh, to an astonishing scale Next thing, it's pretty amazing. Uh, that's to get the gold that's in the dirt away from the creeks and the streams, right? 
But of course, there's also a lot of dirt down in the gravels of the stream itself. Well, what if the, if the stream is a foot deep? You can go in there and get it out. If it's 10 feet deep, you can't. But it's down there. So what do you do? What you do is you move the river. You simply divert the entire stream someplace else to this elaborate operation and then get at the, get at the gravels down here. So, so as you can see, very quickly, it moves from this very, very simple one, two-man operation to something that's approaching a kind of an industrial scale. And appropriately and accordingly, uh, the changes become much larger, increasingly large. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty drastic re, reordering of the environment, right? But that was nothing, nothing compared to the next step. The next step was what's it's still placer mining, it's still the mining of eroded gold. But the next step is what's called hydraulic mining. Hydraulic meaning, obviously, using water. They all used water, but this really uses water. <laughs> hydraulic mining, it's first, it first appears, it's invented here. It first appears in 1853. Uh, interestingly, it was originally done as a, uh, as a safety device. The quarry here, the gold here, was in these ancient riverbeds. Remember, I mentioned that before. The, the gold has been eroding out of the mountains for millions of years, millions of years. And a lot of that gold is in where rivers used to be, rivers millions of years ago, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago. But they, they've moved now. They're no longer there. But the gold is in the gravels that they left behind. Now, some of these gravels, some of these things are, are a couple of hundred feet high. These huge, huge gravel beds. Uh, and there's a lot of gold in there. Everybody knows it. Um, so they go in after it. They went in after what's called coyoting. That is, they would, they would dig tunnels into it and pull the, pull the gravel out, sometimes using blasting powder. But that was really dangerous. It's a very unstable thing. So there's all sorts of, all sorts of you know, cave-ins, accidental explosions, lots of damage. Uh, lots of injuries, lots of deaths. So this guy in 1853 came up with this idea. He says, well, why don't we do this? We could take water using the power of falling water and direct it against these things and just wash them away and you know, wash them down into the larger equivalents of, of long toms. Get it out that way. That way, you know, we're safe. We're back here. Well, it worked in terms of it it's, was safer than coyoting, but they also very quickly found out that this was a far more efficient way to get at the gold. Think of it this way. That gold is scattered. That gold dust is scattered through that huge formation here, right? And they, we know it's there. We know it's there. There's a lot of money in there. <laughs> but it's as if you, you took millions of dollars. You, you have a million-dollar check, right? and you take it to the bank, and said, uh, give me uh, pennies. <laughs> you get a million dollars in pennies, and you scatter it around. Right? The problem is, and it's scattered all over that, all that thing, the problem is getting the pennies out. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of cost-benefit analysis. The kind of amount of work you have to do by simply you know, breaking the thing down physically yourself uh, makes it... Uh, makes it impossible to make any money out of it. You can't get to the gold on a scale to do that. With this, you can do. With this, you can. So how does it work? You find a water source above you in altitude. Then you channel it down to where you want. You send it through these, eventually, iron pipes, first hoses and then iron pipes, and you... At the end of it, you put a, uh, it's kind of a water cannon. It's called a monitor. There was one at the, at the museum yesterday. You all see that? Yeah, it's over there. A monitor. It's like a water cannon. And then you fire it through that cannon uh, against, these, against these hillsides. I might think, you know, that that, uh, it, it, <laughs> that wouldn't create that much of a power. Well, <laughs> this stuff comes out at an 
astonishing rate. <laughs> there are accounts occasionally of, of a, uh, for example, of a cow being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being hit by these streams of water, and they just explode. A few cases of people getting killed. People do these tests. You say, get the strongest guy in camp. You give him a crowbar. You say, okay, go up to that stream of water and try to go through the stream of water. You can't do it. Boom. <laughs> they come out of this astonishing power, astonishing way. You're using water is very heavy. And you, what you're doing is... A, is is accumulating the weight of that water as it comes down from that higher source and then funneling it into, the, funneling it into this, this small nozzle and it comes out with this extraordinary power and it washes this stuff away. And what it does in effect is you know, in a day, in a day, you do what natural erosion would take thousands of years. So this is man-made erosion against these places. And it works. It works. An increasingly larger scale. <laughs> Look at that. See people like ants down here blasting away at this stuff. So once it's blasted away, and then there's a monitor. <laughs> so the water comes through here goes to the monitor, it uh, blasts away at the hillside, and this is washed down here into this um, sluice line, and it goes downstream, down the sluice, here. Here's a grating. So again, this is, this is basically like a, a rocker, except on a vast scale. It goes down through this grating, so the smaller stuff, including the gold, goes down here. The larger stuff goes over the grizzly. It goes down here and then to here. And then it goes into sort of settling basins where it settles down. Uh, and then you process this, and I'll, I'll talk about how that's done in just a moment. So these are enormous, enormous operations. What do they need? What do you need for something like that? Above all, you need water. Lots and lots and lots of water to do this. So they would tap into lakes up in the high country. They would divert rivers above them. <laughs> but to get that water down to where they needed it, they would build flumes, they're called, F-L-U-M-E-S, flumes. These flumes were huge, huge. They're essentially wooden rivers. So what they're doing here is, is re-engineering the entire river system of a region, redirecting the rivers. Some of the really astonishing uh, feats of engineering, like this one. You know, it looks like that view, you know, the, the bus driver yesterday said, told us to look up at, at I-80 when it went across. <laughs> you know, that's, what, that's what this looks like to me. Some of them actually uh, went through, not mountains, but uh, you know, large hills, in effect, redirecting whole watersheds. <coughs> so you have, a, you have a hill here, here, and the water's going down over here. You want it over here, so you burrow through there, and you redirect it into an entire different river system. And then it becomes your river system, <laughs> because you build it. You build it. So look at this one along a cliff. Amazing. They really are very impressive until you look at what they did. Then they're impressive too, but in a, <laughs> in a, di in a different way. Yeah. How much are we talking about? How much are we talking about? We have pretty good estimates of the total length of flumes in California by the end of the 1850s. Now remember the first hydraulic was in 1853. So, seven years. Seven years, they build these wooden rivers. If you took all of the flumes, all of these wooden rivers in California, and you strung them out in one line, how far would they go? Here we are here. How far do you think? Any guesses? The one time you're allowed to speak during the... <laughs> 
Any guesses? In New York. New York? Good guess. Boston and back. California, the, the mother load, where we are, to Boston and back. More than 5,000 miles of wooden rivers in California within seven years of the first hydraulic. What they've done is simply remade the entire riverine environment, not the entire, certainly, but much of the riverine environment of, of much of California. What else they need? Well, um, wood. <laughs> you need a, pretty much amount, a pretty good amount of wood, you know, to, to build a camp, to build the stores and the cabins and the, and the, and the, first, uh, uh, the first sluices and so forth. What do you, how much wood do you need for this? <laughs> so this effect, then the, the deforestation just goes into hyperdrive. You know, whole areas are stripped of trees to provide the wood for this. That, of course, leads to massive erosion, clogging up the, silting up of the streams, destruction of fish, of uh, aquatic life, all sorts of other problems. And that is only one part of the problem with the streams and the water. <laughs> Another one is, once they get into those settling beds, which I was described earlier, now you've got to get the gold out of the detritus uh, that it's, it's part of. How do you get it out? How do you get it out? Well, you can't go in there with pans and do it. Uh, that goes back to the same problem of, of you know, mining the pennies. <laughs> it's just it's not going not to work. So you need to extract it in a much more efficient and expanded way. Now, the first day when I talked about the nature of gold, I said that one of its uh, key um, uh, traits is that it's, it's very, very inert. It doesn't combine with many things at all. There are just a few other elements that gold will join with. One of them, and we talked about this some before, is mercury. Mercury. Uh, it will join with mercury, so you can, you can put mercury into those settling beds. Well, it, it'll then bond, and then you can extract the bonded stuff out of there, and then you separate the mercury from the gold, and you got the gold. Well, where are you going to get the mercury? As it turns out, uh, there was one of the world's largest mercury mines. It, it gets much larger now. Quite near here, over there, uh, what's uh, today's uh, San Jose? At New Almaden, California. Almaden in Spain was an area, was a place where there was a big silver, I mean, a uh, quick silver, a cinnabar mercury mine. Uh, this was New Almaden. It was already producing mercury. <clears throat> this mercury was being sent down into Mexico to process the gold in the mines and the mines down there. But here, you know, one more coincidence, it's, it's right at hand. It's in the neighborhood. <laughs> so this mine then began to go into itself, go into sort of hyperdrive to produce the mercury needed to process the gold uh, in these hydraulics. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the raw stuff. This is cinnabar. Huge deposit of it there. Cinnabar uh, itself is per is perfectly harmless. So you take the cinnabar out uh, of the mine, and the mine is expanded greatly. It goes down hundreds of feet eventually. They're using uh, Hispanic labor, um, virtually virtually slave labor, going down in these mines on these ladders, carrying this stuff with these packs on their back, car carrying them up, you know, hundreds of feet up. And then the cinnabar is taken out, and it's it's uh, put into these they're called roasters. It's crushed down, roasted, as they say, and the roasting then extracts the mercury. Well, cinnabar is harmless. Mercury is not harmless. <laughs> mercury, as I'm sure you know, is poisonous. It's poisonous. It uh, has all kinds of awful effects. I've got, yeah, here we go. Yeah. It uh, uh, produces a massive salivating uh, Anxiety, you get all the jitters. Uh, it uh, soars, as you see on that guy. Um, eventually, insanity uh, and death. Nasty stuff. You're all probably familiar in, in Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter. 
<laughs> mercury was used in making hats, the felt of hats, and hatters uh, suffered from mercury poisoning. And so did, of course, the people, the people here. Uh, not only is the mercury poisonous, the smoke that comes out is poisonous. So if we have descriptions of this area around it, and whole areas around it are uh, denuded of trees, not because they're cut down, uh, they're, killed, they're killed by the mercury fumes. Uh, the cattle all die. The workers lived in a, in a, in a small uh, village uh, near here, and they walked around with masks over their face to try to avoid it. But still, uh, still there was massive mercury poisoning among these, among these people. And including, of course, the engineers who worked with her. There's a collection at the Huntington Library of a guy who was here, and he writes home to his dad. He said, boy, this is not good. <laughs> I, can't, I can't sleep at night. I've got the jitters. I, my, my appetite's gone. You know, I'm just slobbering down my chin the whole time. So he got out pretty quickly. But So this is, the, this is how mercury was produced. And then, of course, it's taken to the hydraulics uh, to process the gold. Now, what should we talking about? What you're talking about? It's estimated that the hydraulics in California hydraulics, uh, before they, they finally ended, um, used more than 10 million pounds of mercury. At the height of these, of this hydraulicing, they were using about 1.4 uh, million pounds per year, dumping it into here. Where does it go? Where does the mercury go? They hope to save it, of course. It costs money. So they did all they could to save, once the gold and the mercury were separated, to, to preserve the mercury. But inevitably, of course, uh, this is not that sophisticated operation. Inevitably, it got out and went into the streams. So massive amounts of mercury, then, goes into these streams and rivers. It is then becomes part of the ecosystem of the river. It breaks down uh, into forms uh, that are then consumed indirectly by the fish. Uh, then the larger fish eat the smaller fish, and the even larger fish uh, eat those fish. By the time the fish got up to the size uh, that people ate, uh, the concentration has increased something like 100,000 times. So people are eating these mercury-contaminated uh, fish, and the water itself, of course, is contaminated. It's a lot of water. <laughs> As I mentioned before, you get all that flu. Um, the amount of water you, the, the largest of these hydraulics, called the Great, what was it, the Great North, uh, do, do, do remember what it is? Okay, okay. <laughs> the North Field, the Great North Field mine, hydraulic mine. Oh, uh, North mine. What is it? Bloomfield. North Bloomfield, thank you, thank you. The North Bloomfield mine. Um, it, in one day, at its height, this mine used as much water as the city of London used in one day. So imagine the water supply of, Lo of London, the day's water supply of London being diverted into this one, in this one mine. And all of that water is being sent down. It's being, con it's being filled with, uh, it's, being, it's being contaminated by mercury. Um, the results of this are, are still with us. Here's a sign today in the Santa Cruz area, or Santa Clara area. Still there. Al was telling me uh, yesterday about other, other um, lingering effects, right, of the, of, of the gold rush, yeah. Okay, so that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem that continues to, continues to be with Californians. Um, there's another problem. It proves to be even more uh, intractable. Uh, now think of this now. You're watching enormous amounts of gravel and dirt out of these hillsides, right? And they're going down through these systems, and you're dumping the larger stuff, and then you've got these others. You've got to get that. Well, once you get down, of course, to what you want to keep, which is the gold and the mercury, uh, what do you do with the rest? It's a lot of stuff, <laughs> A lot of dirt, a lot of nasty stuff. It's called slurry. How do you get rid of it? You can't let it build up. You know, or pretty, pretty soon you'll be covered with it. So you've got to get rid of it. You've got to get rid of it. How do you do that? Well, some of it was, again, really quite impressive. 
There were some of these larger hydraulics that would sink a shaft down in the earth and then tunnel outward to a nearby canyon or something. Right? Might be a quarter mile, might be a half mile. So what they did was, in effect, build their own <laughs> caves, tunnels. We have descriptions of these places. You know, the water's going down there. The waterfalls, you know, man-made subterranean waterfalls and cataracts down there as this stuff is washing out. It's all, it's all going down, flushing out, flushing out of this area, down into this place, sort of out of sight, out of mind. Eventually, of course, it's got to go into the rivers, into the streams. Flush it downstream, flush it downstream, get rid of it, get rid of it. And it's a lot of it. A lot of it. How much are we talking about? How much dirt? Think of it, just, just think of it in terms of dirt. How much dirt are we talking about? It's flushed out of the Sierra Nevada, down into these river systems, and eventually down to San Francisco. <laughs> One of the great geologists of the 19th century, a man named Grove Carl Gilbert, brilliant geologist, he tackled that problem. He looked at this. He looked at this, and he said, uh, and he tried to calculate, just look very, very closely at the, at the evidence, you know, at the, at the materials of, of these hydraulic companies. And he came up with a, with a rough guess, a rough, very well-educated guess of how much we're talking about. How much? How much is it? Well, okay. Imagine the Panama Canal. How much dirt did they take out to dig the Panama Canal. It's a lot. Okay, now think of that. Think of that amount of dirt and now multiply it by six and a half times. Six and a half the volume, six and a half times the volume of debris taken out to dig the canal across the Isthmus of Panama. That's how much was flushed out of here. One other example, think of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Big thing, right? Now fill it with dirt. Now multiply it two and a half times. Two and a half times the volume of the Pyramid of Giza was washed out. So much was washed out of the Sierra Nevada, of these areas up here. So much was washed out. Eventually goes downstream. A lot of it, as we'll see, stays along the course but a lot of it makes it all the way to San Francisco. So much was washed out that eventually it affects the tidal patterns in San Francisco Bay. Uh, Gilbert, Grove Carl Gilbert, uh, argued in this book, uh, in this study, came in the 1930s, I remember, argued that this is the first time, uh, the first time in human history that man becomes a, what's he called, a geomorphic force. It's the first time in human history that people have become a geological force. Not just changing the environment. We're always doing that. Not just changing the environment in, the, in that way, but changing the, literally the shape, the fundamental shape of the earth itself. Right here. Okay, so where's it going? It's going down these river systems, right? It fills up these rivers at an astonishing rate. It's going down these river systems. It's, it's settling as, it, as, as they come out of the mountain. As the falling water levels out, it settles down to the bottom. It settled, and, the, and the rivers, the river beds then began to rise. Began to rise. 100 feet and more. It, it, so a town like Marysville, for example, when it was founded, it's sort of a market center for the mines up in the hills. A town like Marysville uh, was on the river, and it was probably 20 or 30 feet down to the river, right? Well, pretty soon, the river's coming up. And pretty soon, it's level, and then it's above. It starts flooding the town. So they build levees along the river to protect the town from the river it's rising because of all the stuff flushed down from above it. Water, of course, it's nasty and polluted, poisonous in some cases. 
causes the problem. The problem is even greater uh, for the farmers. Remember, as these towns expanded, um, uh, the uh, agriculture begins to develop around them. Farmers come in, begin to clear the area and to, and, to, and to farm the area, right? They're all along the rivers. Now all of the stuff, this, coming, this stuff is coming down. It's flooding out. The rivers flood uh, you know, periodically, almost annually. And as they flood, they send this stuff uh, to the, um, over into the farmer's fields until... After a while, in some cases, and this is very well documented because there's a series of lawsuits over this, very well documented. In some cases, an entire farm, virtually an entire farm, you know, is covered with this slurry. It's, it's of course, completely inerable. There's no way you can use it for anything. Uh, in often cases, it's, it's poisonous. So you're out of business. You're out of business. And it was that that finally brought an end uh, to, the, to, the hydraulic, uh, to the hydraulic system. It wasn't, it wasn't because people were especially concerned about the environment, except for economic reasons. This wasn't an outrage of what was, what, what was happening to the, uh, to the, to the world. <laughs> it was the fact that the farmers were, were going under. Now, I'll talk a little bit later about what happens in the California economy. The gold production peaks around 1852 and 1853, it begins to decline. Um, at the same time, agriculture is booming, booming. So if you think of this in t- terms of a classic you know, political conflict between interests, the mining interests versus the agricultural interests, you know, the balance is tipping. So at one point, f- finally, um, there, there are a series of efforts uh, to, to try to control or to, or to stop this. None of them work. So finally, there is this uh, lawsuit against the, um, I can never remember, the North, the North Bloomfield, I've got a middle block, North Bloomfield Mine and others, and others um, to uh, either halt or pay reparations, pay damages, which of course would be impossible. Uh, to pay for that, would, uh, they couldn't possibly do it. So it's essentially, it's a lawsuit to stop, to stop hydraulic. Uh, it goes into goes into a court. It's fought out over a, a lengthy period of time. Uh, very expensive lawsuit on all sides. Um, very interesting lawsuit. If you look at the arguments on, on both sides, uh, a couple of my favorites, uh, the, the attorneys for the, uh, uh, for the mines, right? they argued, um, this guy's suing him, right? So look what you've done. They said, well, how do you know it's me? Can you tell exactly whose mess that is? <laughs> I said, which I guess true enough. Uh, but uh, you know, the other attorneys for the farmers said, uh, I don't care if it's you or him. This is what it is. And what you guys are doing is what the effects. And the court said, yeah, well, you're right. You're right. Then, this is my favorite argument, my favorite argument. then uh, the attorneys uh, for the mines said, okay, it's ours. Right? Okay, you got me. It's ours. So all of our stuff now is over your field. It's not your land anymore. It's our land. <laughs> this, is, this is our land. This is our, uh, our mess. <laughs> Whatever. And the judge said, I don't think so. That doesn't work either. So and finally it goes to a decision. That everybody expected, or many people uh, suspected, that it was going to go in favor of the vines because the, uh, the, uh, the judge, a man named Sawyer, uh, was very pro minor pro mines in other ways, um, but he said no. He said, "Farm, they're absolutely right. Uh, this is, this has to stop. Uh, either you, either you pay for it, or you stop." And they stopped. 1874, the decision. So in effect, hydraulic mining comes to an end around 1874. But the effect, effects, as you can see, if you go to there's, there are sites around the uh, Malakoff, the Malakoff uh, dig, uh, hydraulic diggings uh, is a, a dramatic uh, example of this. The polluted, uh, p- polluted streams and the rest. So it's still we're still still living with it. Okay, all of that is placer mining. Um, there was this other kind of mining, of course, uh, load mining. This is the mining that attempts to get at the veins of gold that are not yet eroded in the mountains, gold in Dimdar Hills. And to that you, you burrow into, take a, 
a good guess <laughs> where you're going to find those vines, uh, those, those veins. Uh, you burrow it into it, and if you can, if you can find them, you know, paying them out, then you pull out, you you, you crush the rock, you, you blast the stuff away, haul out the haul out the ore, quartz and granite, haul it out, and then and then process it. Now I'm not going to go in, into a great bit of detail here. In the first place, and if, if you're looking at California. Uh, the, 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 by far the largest amount of gold taken out of California, measured by money, was placer gold. Uh, but there was load mining. We were up very close to Grass Valley yesterday. Grass Valley uh, had, had load mining, and there were other load, load mines around. The, the, but this is uh, an anticipation of what's going to happen across to the rest of the West. Now, t- tomorrow, uh, uh, the presentation on some of the industrialization of the West through, through these sorts of things, um, and I'll talk more about load mining. I will depart from the title of the seminar <laughs> by, going <coughs> excuse me, by going over the Sierra to the Comstock Lode. That's not gold, it's silver. Actually, it's gold and silver, but primarily silver. Uh, it's in Nevada. It's not in California, but it's really kind of an offshoot of the experience here. The, it, it, they start by mining gold, and then they find silver, and they start mining silver. And now that was the most um, dramatic example of load mining uh, in the West. But there would also be load mining across the, uh, the mining West, the, uh, the mountain West, uh, load mining in, in Colorado, load mining down in, in Arizona as well. So we'll get a, but I'll go into more detail about how that worked uh, tomorrow. But today, if we're talking about uh, the environmental costs, the environmental effects of this, let's look at some of that of what, what this meant. How does this, how does this work? Okay. These guys burrowing down <laughs> into the ground uh, to pull out, the, um, pull out the rock. Now remember, this is uneroded gold. So this is gold that's still you know, embedded in the rocks. So you, you break it down, you blast it into, these, and, uh, to, and, uh, into small enough pieces. You can haul them out in carts. And then you dump them, and then you... Here's a, uh, this, is in, uh, this is in Grass Valley. This is the uh, Mar- Maryland-Idaho mine, I think it's called. It's the Empire Mine up in Grass Valley. This is now a state park, I think, isn't it, Alta? Yeah. yeah. You can go up and visit, and visit this. <laughs> uh, places like this. So what does this take? Once again, look at this now. Wood takes a lot, a lot of wood. So, in addition to wood being taken to build the mining towns themselves, wood being, take, wood being taken to, uh, uh, to build the, slu- the first uh, sluices and the flumes, and then w- wood being taken to build those wooden rivers, you know, now you're taking the wood and you're putting it underground. In these mines. And it's a lot. Especially, again, when you go over into other, into other more extensive, more developed uh, load mining areas. The Comstock. We have a pretty good estimate that the amount of wood used in the Comstock um, underground and above ground, above ground the wood was used um, for the building of the town, of course, uh, but also uh, for fuel for the mills, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the the greatest amount was underground. Comstock load, the tunnels (laughs) under the Comstock load eventually totaled 200 miles. 200 miles of tunnels under uh, Virginia City and the area around there. All of them held up by wood. We've got a pretty good estimate uh, about how much wood was used in the Comstock, uh, <coughs> measuring, of course, by board feet. That is, uh, the amount of, amount of timber uh, to make a plank uh, a foot wide, an inch thick. If you were to take all of that wood and turn it all into planks, a foot wide and an inch thick, and you lay all of those planks end to end, how, lo- how far would they go? 150,000 miles. 150,000 miles of planks. All of it used in that one place, in the Comstock. Now expand that into the whole area and all of those other areas of mining, of load mining across the West. In effect, they're just re- <laughs> retooling the entire forest system, or much of it, at least. 
Now, there are other ways, uh, other ways that load mining um, had, had these environmental effects. I'll go into those tomorrow. We talk about uh, talk about the industrialization of the West through uh, through mining and other other economies. But that was the main way. So up top, then uh, this uh, this ore is taken out. It's then sent uh, to these mills where it's processed. How do they do that? First thing you do is you have to crush it. What they're trying to do is to break it down, break it down <laughs> into the form, basically the form that you would find in a stream. Right? Uh, break it down to the point where the gold dust can be extracted from it. You've got to pulverize it, pulverize it. That was done through um, stamp mills. Now they, they had, they've had stamp, basic form of stamp mills for hundreds of years. But in California, they developed what's called a California-style stamp mill that becomes the sort of the prototype for those across the rest of the West. There's an example, there was an example at the museum yesterday of the, of the California stamp mill. Did you all see that? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically, think of an internal combustion engine yeah. with the, uh, uh, the pistons you know, going off a rotating uh, rod or whatever you call that thing. What's the term for it? A what? Camshaft, thank you. Of the camshaft, um, Great Northfield find, right? Are you familiar with camshaft? Okay. <laughs> okay. So you know, uh, just like in a car, you know, like that. That's how this works. You, know, you power this thing, and it turns. And as it, as it turns, these stamps are going up and down, up and down, up and down, pounding them. And you put the ore in there. It pounds and crushes it. You can use water <laughs> to get it out. It's water to get it out. And, and then you get down the solution down there, and then you treat it with mercury, more mercury, which of course is then often lost into the streams, and process it out that way. So in effect, what they're doing is taking the gold in its original form, and they're accelerating the entire process that finally gave them gold through the placer system. Okay. It's a huge operation. One thing that struck me yesterday, and we went to the Indian Museum, right? And uh, at one point, Al was describing what about the acorns. Remember, remember the acorns? Uh, the, and he was describing how they were uh, how they were processed. Indian women processed them. And he made the point. You know, there was photographs up there. He made the point that they didn't stir them. They didn't grind them. They pounded them. And yesterday at the museum, I don't know, uh, uh, our guide at least, uh, Karen. Uh, she was. She showed those places in the in the stone, you know, where the uh, where they were there, and that's where they had been pounding like that. So I thought I stood there and says, "Oh, huh, huh." <laughs> you got Indian women pounding acorns, and fifty feet away, this. You know, <laughs> there's there's a way, there's a way in which this encapsulates the entire story. This way of life to that way of life. Pounding to pounding. <laughs> Any case, this also is done in, on an increasingly large scale. <clears throat> the one you saw yesterday was sort of the scale that they uh, began with out here. As the binding west expands, uh, this becomes increasingly sophisticated, increasingly industrialized. This is the same thing. These are stamp mills um, in the Black Hills up in the 1870s, mid-1870s. Look at the size of this thing. Enormous. Like the biggest factory in the East. So, there's this left. You'll see these all over the West. California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, everywhere you see. These are the tailings. Now, you don't nearly pay much attention to it. But what I want you to do, the next time you're driving one of those areas, you see this. Think of this. That's just the slightest suggestion of what's going on here. What's going on here? Right? <laughs> A lot's going on here. A lot. Okay, one final point um, to, to end with. Um, when we talk about environmental change here, um, it's natural to focus on the place itself. Focus on the mining town, to you know, focus on the placers, to focus on the hydraulics, to focus on the load load mine, to focus on the Comstock, you know, to focus on Grass Valley, to look there to keep our keep our vision tighter in this sort of a tight radius. Um, as always, <laughs> on the first day, it's important always to pull back, you know, to pull back and look at this. 
another implication of this distinctive pattern of Western expansion, of Western expansion, of it occurring far from the mother culture, mother society, way out here, way out there, way out there, way out there, is that there's this immediate impulse uh, to connect to it. Right? You've got to get to these places, especially when you're talking about thousands and thousands of people. So there's this immediate uh, effort uh, to build roads, trails. Eventually, of course, railroads and so forth, but the first impulse, uh, and this remains uh, you know, long after the completion of the first transcontinentals. There were many, many, many times more miles of freight roads, of, of, ro- of just simple roads in the West to connect all this stuff together than of rails. So think of that. I showed you that map earlier of the road system over here. Well, that's what's happening now over here. But think, just starting with the Overland Trails. Right? We've looked at this map a few times at least. Ways to get out there. So what's, what's happening along the trails? Environmentally, what's happening along the trails? Well, I, uh, when I talked about the rush, I, looked, I talked about some of that. Remember the slide I showed you down by Dodge City, the, uh, the ruts of the Santa Fe Trail going through here? Slab is right about from right about here. This uh, enormous erosion, sort of abrasion, mass abrasion of the land itself. But these people, uh, they're coming across in the summer, of course. They're also uh, cutting the trees to use for fuel. They're also grazing their animals. If they're you know if there are fifty thousand people crossing crossing the plains, for every person. There are three or four animals, oxen mainly, but also horses, eventually sheep. They're all eating the grass. We're talking about millions of animals being driven and led across the plains. They're taking their toll. They're polluting the water. We've talked about that. What effect does that have on Indian peoples? Didn't go into this, uh, but uh, on the Great Plains and even more so in the Great Basin, Indians had to have access to those river valleys, those river streams. It was along the rivers. Uh, first of all, and especially in the Great Basin, that a lot of the grasses grew uh, that they used uh, for food, they, the seeds. They harvested the seeds of these grasses. Well, they're now, all those grasses are now in the bellies of, of the oxen. Uh, the trees. The Indians, during the summer, the Indians for the most part were out on the high country, out on the plains, hunting. That's the great you know, the bison rut and the great bison hunts uh, during the summer. Uh, when it gets cold, uh, they can't go back home to Iowa. When it gets cold, they have to go to the riverbeds. Those are the protected areas. Anything that lives outside of those riverbeds is, is taking its life in its hands. This is a very dangerous environment in the winter. But you can make it in the rivers. These, these riverine habitats, that's where the trees are, the cottonwoods. Willows, they need the water for their horses. They need the protection of those, uh, those slightly depressed, uh, slightly depressed uh, streams. Right? They have to have it. If they can't, if they don't have access to that place in the winter, they're in big, big, big trouble. I figured out once, uh, estimated, we have good estimates by anthropologists, how much wood a, a camp of uh, 25 or 30 people used. How much wood do they use in a winter? 25 or 30 people. Uh, it's basically the equivalent of 11 of the largest moving vans that we have today, floor to ceiling, side to side. So they come back in the winters, no trees. They're going by the by, uh, by uh, middle of 1860s, uh, actually before that. There were there were literally two trees recorded by Overland Travelers on the whole Platte River uh, Road. They were both ironically called Lone Tree. <laughs> and then they were gone. Somebody cut them down. Right? No tree. You could go up in the canyons and find cedars, but you had to go far away. Grass is gone. It's disastrous. Catastrophic. So the, the environmental effect 
of a gold rush is far more than, than the area of the rush itself. Galapagos <laughs> turtles are being decimated in the Galapagos Islands. You know, uh, riverine environments in Nebraska are being uh, stripped of what Indian peoples have to have. So it, it's a the effect is far wider, including, of course, we looked. Um, here's a very rare photograph of an Indian encampment, winter Indian encampment. Including the effect, and we looked at this as well during the rush, of um, disease. Remember, uh, these overland trails uh, were these, you know, I, these, these things that are almost, they seem to be ideally uh, constructed uh, for the communication of diseases. And they did. And during the rush, I, I talked about the effect of these diseases on the, on the rushers, <laughs> on the overlanders themselves. Uh, and it was pretty impressive. Hundreds of graves along the trails of, of overlanders. But of course, the same, they're also bringing diseases to the Indians. The Indians, the Indians who would come into the camps you know, to ask for biscuit, biscuit, you know, to ask for the toll uh, for passing through there. Out of curiosity, communicated to them as well. 1849, uh, absolutely catastrophic year for Plains Indians because that was one of the cholera years, remember? Cholera sweeps through uh, the camps of the uh, Cheyennes. One entire Cheyenne band disappeared. So many died in that band that the others dispersed uh, into the other bands. Others took horrific, horrific losses. Uh, some native sources say that their population dropped by half. It's probably too high. But still, they were... Uh, Absolutely horrific, horrific losses to this. This is a, it's called a winter count. You all know what a winter count is? A, a winter count is, this is the way that uh, Plains Indians, at least, uh, wrote their history. It's, a, it's usually on a hide, a bison hide or a deer hide. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a spiral, a spiral made of these individual uh, little, little drawings. Drawings and each of those drawings represents, in the collective memory, uh, those people's collective memory, the most important thing, most notable thing that happened in that particular year. All right. So you have this is this is the year that the crows attacked and stole all of our horses, something like that. And they'll have a and there's a designated historian. His job is to remember the story behind this, and so they would to tell their story. They would go year by year the spiral out there. Fast, absolutely fascinating. There are wonderful websites of this if you're interested in looking into them. This is um, a Kiowa winter count uh, for the year 1849. Uh, and it shows a man, the story behind it is cholera. This is a man who's sort of pulled up in a fetal position, uh, his mouth open, screaming in agony. Cholera is a nasty, nasty disease. And the death rate among the Kiowas, again, uh, was um, absolutely, absolutely horrific. So I'll end with um, this thing I came across uh, a while back, uh, reading through the account of a man named Howard Stansberry. Howard Stansberry was an Army uh, engineer. Uh, he was on a he was going with a group of the Corps of Engineers out to out to California. It was a very good account of, of, of that trip and also what he. In fact, the title of it is What I Saw in California when he got out there. But if you read Stansbury's account going across the plains, there's this day when they stop, they stop for the day, uh, take the day off, stop, uh, and he looks over the, on, the, on the North Platte, he looks over the North Platte and he sees, a, he sees lodges. He sees five Indian lodges, teepees, teepees. He says, oh, so I'll go over there and check them out. So he gets a white flag, you know, and he uh, goes across the river and waves the flag, you know, and, um, and he uh, approaches. Nobody's there. So he goes up to them and, and looks in the lodges. And, 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 and for the lodges, there are men. These are Lakota, uh, Western Sioux, um, the ones we think of as the Sioux, the horseback, horseback Sioux, Lakotas. Um, and there are Lakota men, corpses. 
and they're dressed in their warrior finery. There's shields uh, and, and spears and bows and arrows. Uh, they're very best, very best clothes. They're uh, wrapped in, in bison robes. Uh, death from cholera. He went to the fifth one, and he said there was this beautiful um, 16-year-old girl, and she was wrapped in the, a very high-quality bison robe. Uh, she had on red leggings, beautiful um, deerskin uh, clothes. Uh, moccasins uh, decorated with porcupine quills. You've, you've seen, probably seen this stuff. Fabulous uh, bead work, um, kind of like the one, not too unlike what we saw in the museum yesterday. Um, dead. Uh, so he went back to his camp, ooh, sort of chastened. Uh, went back to his camp, got to his camp, where his men were celebrating. <laughs> Why were they celebrating? The reason they had stopped for the day was that this was Independence Day. This was July 4th, 1849. So to me, you know, that uh, sums up a lot, a lot of his story. Uh, here it is, you know, the, the day that we use to celebrate American independence, celebrate you know, the birth of the republic. In the year 1849, that to us, in the popular mind, you know, stands for opportunity. I mean, we named professional football teams after 1849, right? <laughs> Highways, like Highway 49 yesterday. You know, to us, July 4th, 1849, you know, of course, those stand with, uh, that's what the West was all about. Uh, well, yeah, that's also what the West was all about. That's also the environmental impact of gold, of gold in California. That will be the topic of the next two uh, presentations. Uh, but I want you to think about that. When you look at, look at photographs like this, and when you watch paint your wagon on TV, or <laughs> this, uh, uh, this, you know, hole for the gold fields uh, uh, kind of a thing, uh, think about it as well. This is, uh, again, I talked before, the, the benefits for this country of all of this were enormous. Enormous. But there was a price. There was a price that we're still paying. There was a price to the land, a price to the environment, and most of all, a price to the people whose land that was at the time. And that was what we will look at um, in the next session. So, that's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we've got, we got, um, got some time for questions, I think. Do we not? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. You spoke about the price that we're paying. Uh, still paying today. How much of the, the river valleys, um, the, the river you know, ecosystems that the trails covered overland have recovered today, and how much of the land, um, the wooded areas of California have recovered? Yeah, well, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Uh, recover, what does recovered mean? If you go out to these places, if you, you can follow the overland trail now, yeah, but it's all, of course, uh, um, it's all, of course, uh, you know, uh, Denny's. <laughs> so this is, this is, the trails were where they were because that was, the, that was a natural way for moving across the plains. Uh, it's the way that Indians have moved across for generations before that, hundreds of years before that. It's the way that interstates go across now. I've got a, for my class, I've got a slide that shows these uh, Indian routes at the time of contact, and I put it next to a, a map of interstates. It's the same thing. So they're not, it, they don't recover back Nothing ever recovers back the way it was. Environmental change never reverses. Uh, but what we see, what you see is it's, it's being developed in other ways. Uh, you don't see, of course, the kind of devastation that I showed you. But you see a, 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 still a very, very different, different place. Of course, reforestation in California, a lot of it, a lot of it has come back. There's this very interesting um, method of called re-photography now. People who have gone back and gotten, uh, you know, iconic photographs, famous photographs of places in the past, uh, and then they will try to get exactly at the same angle, exactly the same place, exactly the same time of day, and, and take a photograph today. You know? And there's some over at the Comstock, and it's quite, a, it's quite amazing. You go back to the Comstock, and it's just a, a wasteland, and there's all these trees. <laughs> so, you know, the land does have a way, does have a way of coming back. But of course, there are other ways in which it takes much, much, much longer. Mercury chemical pollutions, 
things like that. Other other kinds of mining. Um, there's a mine not north of here is a town of Reading. There's a mining site. There's a site there. It's not a gold mine, not a gold mine, but it's a mine. Uh, that uh, the water coming out of that mine is uh, officially designated uh, the worst water in the world. <laughs> quite literally, quite literally, <laughs> its acidic content is 6,300 times the content of the acidity of battery acid. You know, well, that doesn't correct itself very quickly. Those, those kinds of uh, environmental effects are, are stick around for a long, long time, and it's something, of course, we need to think about today. Yes? So, you said in, in 1874 there was uh, this lawsuit uh, well, hydraulic mining was stopped in 1874 as a result of a lawsuit. Um, in the 1870s, we see the first national parks are designated in the West. <laughs> to what extent did the gold miners or the, the gold mining influence the creation of the first national parks? Or who was advocating for the environment in, these, in this time? It's a, it's a fascinating question. Uh, well, I'm trying to remember what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. But there's a uh, the whole story of the creation of the first national parks. The one in, uh, first in California, of course, is Yosemite. The first national park, not just in the United States, but in the world, uh, is Yellowstone. It's two years before that, 18, 1872. It's really an entirely different impulse, except, except to this degree. By that time, the American public is becoming aware uh, of the velocity of this change uh, out in the West. And this is a time in which, they, this is after the Civil War, and they're seeing the West increasingly as a, a place where the country can unite, where we can come together. You know, put all of, this, all of this Civil War stuff and sectionalism uh, behind us. And one way they do that is they look to the West uh, as, as ways of forming a sort of common identity. And one of the ways that you can find a common identity from the United States, as opposed to England or the old world, is um, okay. You guys have got the Colosseums, you've got the cathedrals, you've got very old cities. We've got wilderness, beautiful wilderness, bizarre wilderness uh, like Yellowstone. So there's this impulse to create these islands uh, of what people see as pristine, untouched places. They weren't, of course. These were all Indian lands. But they, they need to believe there's something out there you know, that will preserve whatever, what it is, those things that are distinctively American, you know, that preserves our identity. There are also economic interests involved in this. Uh, the, the Yellowstone Park is, is created essentially by the Northern Pacific Railroad. You know, it's trying to get tourists to go <laughs> Out there, so it's a it's a jumble of impulses. Now I don't think I don't think uh, that people uh, immediately connected the need for that with the devastation that's going on with mining. Maybe they did. I don't know. Yosemite. I, I haven't studied Yosemite closely enough to see that. You might if it's a place you would expect to find it. It would probably out there. But I don't. You know, Al, any any connection of that? In, Directly, part creation and, and the destruction of the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have it. And I would add just a, a, a comment on the uh, hydraulic mining. It's, um, in effect, it hydraulic mining most places in, in California, but it actually regulated them out of business. Uh, they, yeah, you can you can uh, do your hydraulic mining, but under such strict conditions that it just put most of them out of business. It's, there is one hydraulic mine that is still operating. Wow. It's up out of Auburn, and it's called the Pacific Mine. I've seen it. Uh, I rode in on horseback 40 years ago. I'm not kidding. I just wouldn't lie about a thing like that. The other, the other thing it did was, uh, you know, you have this big hydraulic uh, infrastructure. You can't move that, but you know there, there's the business thing. You can move that. And so they relocated up on the headwaters of the Trinity River, where they continued to do hydraulic mining and uh, spoiled the the uh, salmon fishery of the Trinity River, which is the Hoopa Reservation and everything else down 
stream, and that uh, operated well into the 20th century. I'm not quite sure when they yeah. quit. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. That was it. Yeah. That. Uh, yes, Lindsay. Well, my question kind of ties into what Michael dealt with because you think of today, and obviously there are so many people involved in conservationist efforts in the environment, and all of the accounts we read, people are very factual and straightforward in their description of what they're doing to the land in terms of mining. Were there? Have you come across any accounts where there are people kind of thinking about the actual impact they're having on things? Or yep, yep. I've, I've asked that question myself many, yeah. many times, and I've read a lot of the accounts yeah. here and, and especially elsewhere in Colorado and elsewhere. The only places you see that uh, are on outside visitors, usually well-to-do people who come to tourists who come there and they go, "Holy Toledo!" <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> so people like Isabella Bird, for example, a very famous uh, woman tourist out in, in, in Colorado, uh, they they point that out. Otherwise, you know, this is a, this is a cash cow. You know, this is the golden goose. In fact, in, the, in this book I'm trying to finish, I found, I found this thing, and it he, he goes into some detail about the destruction of this. You know, you know we have, we have. Strip the hills out. We done. Uh, you know, it, it, and he's right. You know, it's this pretty vivid description of the kind of uh, of the kind of uh, changes, the awful things that they were doing. But this is a this is description comes out of a prospectus for a mine. He's boasting of it. <laughs> he's like, see what we can do. <laughs> he's praising what they were doing. Yeah. So they see this as what Gilbert saw. You know, we now are the gods of the earth. Yes? Um, as the form of mining started to progress from faster to another load, mm -hmm. uh, were, as they progressed, were they more and more successful in finding gold, or did it yield the same amount as they progressed? Oh, much more in, the, in amounts of it. Certainly, were much more finding gold. Is a, that's a trickier question. Uh, you know, in those those hillsides that they were uh, that they were uh, blasting with water in the hydraulics, they knew the gold was in there. That's easy enough to find. That's when they first when they went in. It was a matter again of investment as opposed to profit. You know? uh, and it, it just was not economical enough until they until they came up with the, with the hydraulic system. And then the amount. Now remember. And I'll talk about this more in some detail uh, tomorrow. Uh, imagine what something like that cost. These are very expensive operations. And you have to build an elaborate infrastructure before you make a dime. Right? So, um, you know, sometimes months and months and months, a couple of years sometimes, to build something big enough uh, to, to make it pay. That's all outlay. Well, who's doing that? It's not that guy with a rocker. <laughs> but this time, these are huge corporations. This is big, big business, and that's what I want to emphasize tomorrow. We think of the rise of big business in the in these years after the after the eighteen after the Civil War, the fifties on as an Eastern phenomenon. We think of you know think of Carnegie, and we think of uh, Rockefeller and all of that. It's also happening out here. This is, you know, uh, and once you do that, if you're right in your estimate of of what's in there, you, know, you make a lot of money. Profits are huge, and, then, and of course the costs are huge as well. Yes? Uh, you mentioned before how the Native Americans were affected by disease brought by uh, migrants mm -hmm. going west. Um, explorers, Spanish explorers 300 years before were in the area, uh, Hernandez Soto, Cabeza de Vaca wrote in journals, how they arrived in areas where whole, whole tribes had been decimated, and they didn't know why. And the historians now believe it's the disease is brought by the Spanish in the 1500s mm -hmm. to the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, spread faster than they did. Yes. So these diseases, I would imagine, would have also affected the Western uh, United States with Native Americans. So are you saying that the diseases brought by the Americans or Europeans at this time brought also a decimation to the population as bad as the, the one 300 years before, or was it smaller? It, we, we have much 
less of a grip on <laughs> understanding of the, of the numbers of losses earlier. But uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I did not mean to imply that this was the first significant introduction of diseases into this area. That, that had been going on a long time. Smallpox uh, struck, especially in the Southwest and in Texas. It didn't go into the area uh, of the Great Plains and the Pacific Northwest until around 1780, the great uh, smallpox epidemic of 1780-83. Uh, the reason for that was, incidentally, the horse. Indians by that time had the horse before if somebody gets smallpox in the southwest and, and runs away, is they, uh, they would either die or no longer be communicative, uh, no longer uh, couldn't pass it on before they got to any other group. So it's just the distance itself sort of buffered the people of the interior. Uh, 1780, the horse culture is established uh, in the west, and so people can get moved by horse. That way they can commun literally communicate, and so it just sweeps across, sweeps across the west enormous losses of population. That happened again in the 1830s. Uh, uh, malaria uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, probably falciparum, uh, plasmodium falciparum, a uh, very, very deadly kind of malaria strikes there. Continues to strike during this period. Malaria is a terrible problem uh, during the 1860s uh, here. Uh, those are relatively later. So, uh, and of course, they had their own diseases. None of the communicant, none of the diseases that we, uh, that we were most familiar with, uh, those were all brought by, by Europeans. If they had their own, but what I'm saying here is, uh, these overland trails, uh, again, they were they were perfectly designed. <laughs> You're talking about far, far more people going through these Indian lands than had ever gone through before, and they're coming from all of these different places, bringing all kinds of diseases. You know, you know they're, they're drawing on these reservoirs of contagion, and then they're coming through here, thousands of them, and they're living in conditions that are, it's like a, it's like a vast linear petri dish, you know, to, to, to cultivate, to cultivate this stuff, you know. So that's, that's the difference, yeah. Any other questions? What time we got here? Boop, about time. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.